what we were suggested that day was like something from a medieval bottle. I was dragged from the line of officers and into the crowd. I heard someone scream, I got one. I was effectively defenseless and gradually sustaining injury from the increasing pressure of the mob. Then the crowd, perhaps around 20 people, joined in screaming, boo. <laughs> no one had ever, ever called me a while wearing the uniform of a Capitol Police officer. Harrowing testimony from the officers on the front lines of the insurrection from yesterday's January 6th Select Committee's first hearing. It's about the brutal violence they faced. And in the case of Officer Harry Dunn, the shocking racism on full display in the halls of the Capitol that day. That dose of reality about what really happened on January 6th from those officers seemed to represent a direct threat to the right's campaign to downplay and whitewash and rewrite the history of January 6th. Here's how Fox News reacted to that same hearing last night. God save us from these third-rate theatrics. Now, the award for best use of an exaggeration in a supporting role, the winners, Aquilino Gonell. The award for blatant use of partisan politics when facts fail, the angle award goes to Capitol Police Officer Harry Dunn. And for best performance in an action role, the winner is Michael Fanon. Watch Fanon cite the psychological trauma he endured as an excuse for ditching our Bill of Rights. I've been left with the psychological trauma and the emotional anxiety of having survived such a horrific event. <laughs> Let's pray for them, huh? Joining us now, Congresswoman Elaine Luria of Virginia, a member of the January 6th Select Committee. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. I, I wonder, and this is a serious question, how you shield the dignity of these officers who've already sacrificed their bodies and their mental health and their physical health and their careers and their reputations, who are now on the receiving end of menacing voicemails in the case of Officer Fanon and threats to their, their lives and their safety. Well, you know, first I want to start out by saying, you know, that, that these men were incredibly brave for the actions they took that day, for really holding the last line of defense at the Capitol, truly, I believe, the last line of defense for our democracy by the actions they took. And then by coming and telling that story of their traumatic physical and emotional injuries, the brutality that they faced. And then, you know, I hadn't seen these clips that you just showed before right now, and it just makes my stomach turn. I feel that, you know, the this network that, that portrays these officers this way, they're just actively undermining um, the, the heroic you know, service that those officers did that day um, to, to save the Capitol, to prevent the mob from overtaking the, the certification of the election results, you know, seeking out to hang in the gallows that they had put out for, for Vice President Pence. And ultimately what it shows me is that I really feel that the large majority of, of House Republicans today are really truly morally bankrupt. I think that, you know, we look at this and say, how did this happen? It happens gradually over the course of these four years. And then suddenly this event on January 6th happens and shows the threat that faces us. And, you know, I think about it, there, there's just very few people, very few Republicans right now that, that you know, represent people like you know, John McCain and late Senator John Warner. Um, and it's just, it's just distressing um, to see that they're denigrating and, and undermining um, the work of these brave officers. For better or for worse, I, I spent some time in, in the Republican Party, and, and I have, I have this, this thought, and I, and I wonder what you think about this theory. I mean, this isn't a great story for them. They're, they're doing that for a reason. And some of their most devoted regulars, people like Jim Jordan and Kevin McCarthy, may have a whole lot at stake here if they're subpoenaed. And, and I wonder if you see this as part of the defense strategy and if you will be chilled by that. Will you subpoena Jim Jordan, who said on Fox News that he may have talked to Donald Trump that day, he talks to him all the time, and Kevin McCarthy, who we all know, talked to Donald Trump that day? Well, I'll say that well, we've all said this on the committee, that we will subpoena anyone and everyone that it's necessary to subpoena to get the full information of what happened that day. And, you know, do I feel like they're acting like someone who has something to hide? You know, it sure seems like that. I mean, they said right after the events of January 6th that this was a horrific day. Kevin McCarthy himself called this an insurrection. Yet somehow he's forgotten that. Somehow he's forgotten um, the fact that you know he himself was in the Capitol overrun by this mob of insurrectionists and rioters. 
and personally get danger and, and it's just acting it like it didn't happen and pushing forward the other members of his caucus who are saying things like, you know, this was nothing other than a group of tourists enjoying the Capitol, which is absolutely ludicrous. There's so much anecdotal evidence and reporting that so many of, of you knew that this day could be violent. I've interviewed half a dozen members who either wore sneakers or told a spouse where their will could be found. How deep will the investigation go into who knew what ahead of time? Can you just explain the investigation into the intel piece and what was known and how you will pursue that part of the investigation? Well, you're exactly right. I mean, there's lots of pieces to the investigation as far as the intel piece. I think we need to go back to, you know, all of the different elements of the, the government that, you know, have a piece in, in monitoring these types of threats, identifying credible threats, passing that information along to the appropriate law enforcement agencies, whether that be federal, state or local, um, to ensure um, that proper actions and preparations are taken. So a breakdown of intelligence is something that really I'm I'm convinced is that, you know, there's somebody behind this. There's money behind this somewhere. Yeah. Someone paid for these people to come to DC in buses. We heard, of, you know, anecdotally of crowdsourcing of different ways that, that money was raised amongst these organizations, these organized groups. So I think there's just a lot of evidence that needs to be collected um, to understand, you know, where did the money and the resources for something like this come from? And, you know, who did it? Where did it come from? There's even you know, reports and uh, the possibility of, you know, some sort of foreign interference in pushing these groups and, and instigating this through online means. So there's a lot to be looked at. And, you know, that is certainly the work of this committee to make sure that we overturn, you know, every stone uh, to, to find that information and, and um, really understand the full picture of what happened that day, what led up to that day, and find ways to prevent something like this from ever happening again in the future. How much of understanding that involves the president and the White House? The new book by Carol Lennig and Phil Rucker builds on some of the reporting in The Washington Post about how he delighted in watching the insurrection as it took place. There's some reporting that Mike Pence was the one who ultimately had to call in the National Guard. There's that big gap in time. I mean, how much of your investigation will ultimately center on what the president knew and did and when he did it? It's certainly part of it. I think Liz Cheney outlined this very well in her opening statement yesterday. Um, and I think we all agree we need to understand what happened, um, what, what was happening in the White House, what the reaction was, um, and all that chain of events, why it took so long for the National Guard uh, to respond, uh, what the reaction was um, you know, once this violence started, and um, the reaction to that and different people's roles. Um, in the day of, uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about the rally that happened on the ellipse, the sort of call to action um, that appears to have, have happened there to, you know, encourage people uh, to, to head towards the Capitol, um, you know, plus other activity that happened before that. Um, some of the reporting that I've seen, there were many groups that had kind of pre-staged themselves closer to the Capitol. Right. Um, and are part of the, you know, uh, groups of people that, you know, are being investigated for having coordinated um, pre-planned actions. So all of this, all of this, there's a lot for us to um, investigate.